You know, on TV, in all of the hospital rooms, it seems, they have that one machine that makes that nice, steady, semi-reassuring beep, beep, beep sound. You know the one. I've always suspected that machine's entire job was just to make that sound as a way of telling the patient, well, you're in the hospital, which isn't great, but this steady beep means you're not too bad at the moment. And of course, in today's era, that machine would be some kind of networked, embedded system running Linux, because we're in modern times, after all. But what you don't want to hear that medical device doing is making a pew, pew, pew sound. Yeah, that'd be super bad, (laughs) because it means somebody has hacked your medical equipment, and now it's playing Space Invaders or something, which of course leads up to a big lawsuit because your engineering team didn't properly secure the system. Hi, I'm Amelia Dalton, host of Chalk Talk. Securing embedded systems is serious business, particularly when we're dealing with medical devices. Today, my guest is Robert Bates from Mentor, and we're going to talk about the complex task of securing your next embedded medical design. And before we get started, don't forget to click that link. There you can find even more information about medical device security solutions from Mentor. Hi, Rob. Thank you so much for joining me. Hi, Amelia. How are you doing? Great. Thank you for asking. So we're talking about medical device security today, but that has a myriad of issues, right, Rob? What exactly will we be talking about today? Oh, goodness gracious. Over the past 10 years or so, there's really been a huge increase in the number and types of medical devices that are available on the market. And that's a fantastic trend. They improve patient outcomes, they reduce risk, they make therapies available that we didn't even think existed 20 years ago. And to make all of that happen, more and more of these devices are connected to the internet, right? The same internet that we're talking over today. And that is generally a positive thing. But because these devices are connected to the internet and because they have data that is so vital to the patient, personal information, medical information, treatment information, all of that, it's important that we basically think about how do we keep that data confidential, how do we secure it, and how do we protect the networks that they're on. So today, we're going to talk about those things and what people can do as medical device developers to make those results happen. Excellent. So let's start at the beginning. What kind of issues are really coming into play here? There are a number of issues, and most of them come to us from a totally non-medical perspective. When we talk about medical device security, there's the kind of data that we're protecting, personal information that's covered by HIPAA, the other kinds of medical information that needs to be protected. But the kinds of things that can happen to a device are really no different than the rest of us have experienced over the last 20, 30 years. And so when we talk about what can happen, we're talking about the same kinds of protections. We're talking about what makes a device vulnerable. How do we know that a device has a vulnerability and how do we prevent those vulnerabilities from coming in? We know that security vulnerabilities are everywhere. And when they are discovered, they become popular, especially if they happen to you. Everyone remembers the heart bleed, and everyone remembers the Mirai botnet, and everyone remembers all of these kinds of security breaches that have happened over time. And you can't walk down the street today without someone telling you that someone has accessed your personal information. So those are the kinds of issues that we try to prevent in the development of the medical device. Right? And so we look at a number of different things. You know, when we talk about vulnerabilities, what do we mean? Well, we're talking about what is essentially a bug. It's in your application, and it's in your application in a way that can be exploited by an internal or external application in a way that wasn't intended. And they are everywhere, and more and more of them are discovered every day. So that's one of the things we want to protect ourselves against. And then the other one is access control. Can we guarantee that the people who are able to access information from the device, the people that should be? If I'm a patient, I want to be able to see certain information. If I'm a doctor, 
I want to see maybe other kinds of information. Or I want to be able to impact what the device is doing, like with an infusion pump that is going to put in medicine into the patient. You don't want the patient fiddling with that, but you want the patient to know that what was supposed to happen, happened. So you have different kinds and different levels of access. And so how do you make sure that only the people that are supposed to have different kinds of access have it? So, Rob, I would imagine that regulations and life cycle concerns would also come into play here as well. Is that correct? Oh, goodness gracious, yes. When we look at what's happening now, more so than ever, when you're developing a medical device, what you have been worried about is, does it do what you intend it to do? And is it safe to be used on a patient? And safety is a different topic. But basically what you're trying to do is you're trying to provide benefit to the user while minimizing potential harm. Doesn't mean that you've eliminated it. Anyone who's watched a commercial on the television for a drug knows that there are side effects. Those are negative things that can happen. Same thing's true with devices. But what the regulators are looking for is, are the bad things not nearly as bad as the good things that the treatment is going to achieve, okay? So more and more today, those same regulators are really focused on security. It's kind of a laser-sharp focus. It's, It's kind of surprising. If I am creating a medical device today, the main submission that I make to the FDA is called a 510K packet. It's not a 401k, but it's a 510k packet. And basically, it is a pre-marketing submission to the FDA that must include security aspects if your device is connected to the internet. And the FDA has provided guidance for both pre-market and post-market considerations for cybersecurity that you have to follow and be able to answer as part of your 510k packet. And while I talk about the FDA, because I'm coming from the U.S., Canada and Japan and the EU and Australia and other regions of the world have their own very similar regulations. And then once you release the product, you need to basically think about how you're going to keep that device secure during its complete life cycle, which could be years or decades. And so when we think about that, we think about what kinds of security issues can your device have when you release it and how do you minimize or eliminate those? What kinds of security issues can kind of pop up during the lifetime of the device and how do you protect yourself to the greatest extent possible and how do you take care of them once they become known? And then you also want to look at how you're designing and developing your device so that it can be difficult to exploit after it's released. That makes sense, Rob. So how do we actually know what issues we should be concerned about? So this is where we can leverage security processes and information that have been in place for 20, 30 years, for a long time. And take advantage of the fact that many security issues and the underlying reasons why they occur are known to development communities around the world. The main way that we get information about vulnerabilities is through a process called CVE, or Common Vulnerabilities and Exposures. The CVE process, it's owned by the Mitra Corporation. It's a joint effort of the Mitra Corporation, which is a public corporation that works with the U.S. government on all topics of security and other things as well. And they are linked together with something that's called the National Vulnerability Database. And what the CVE is, is it's this collection, this list of known issues that have occurred over time and a process on how these things get discovered, reported, communicated, and fixed. And so there's no real reason, other than effort, that there should be CVEs in your device when you release it. Right? If you're using open source, there are tools that can help you do this, like a tool like CVE Check, which correlates CVEs and the versions of the open source modules that you're using allows you to know, okay, I am using, say, OpenSSL. OpenSSL had these CVEs, and they were fixed in some version of OpenSSL that I can make sure that I am using. So it gives me this kind of upfront knowledge of how to take care of these vulnerabilities that may exist in your product. Now, Rob, I would imagine that access control is also an important thing to think about here as well. And 
poor passwords cause all sorts of havoc, right? They do. Yeah, and we talked a little bit about access control at the beginning. Basically, the whole point is, is have you really thought about what kinds of users are going to have access to the device and what kinds of access should those users have? If you have a personal device, something that would be used in the home, you might have a patient access, you might have a doctor or medical staff access, you might have a technician access, which would also handle things like repairs. And you think about what kinds of things should those roles be able to do with the device? And that's going to be device specific. The number of roles and the kinds of things they can do are going to be different, say, from a, a CPAP machine that a person with sleep apnea might use when they're sleeping, or like an MRI device, right, where the patient doesn't really interact with it at all other than sitting there for an awfully long time in a cramped little room. And so you think about for the device, what are the roles? What should they be able to do? And then there's a concept that comes to us originally from, say, military security called the principle of least privilege. And all the principle of least privilege is, is when you decide what the roles are and what they should be able to do, when you implement them, you want to make sure that the roles can do what they need to do and nothing else. Because in that way, you can keep the roles boxed. And if a role gets compromised, then there's only certain kinds and so much damage they can do. So that's access control. You need to think about those things during the design of the device. And then passwords. I don't know if you remember the Mirai botnet, which took down large chunks of the internet here in the United States a couple of years ago. But the Mirai botnet was a very interesting little thing. All it was was a little program that went around the internet and tried to connect to devices. And if it connected to devices and it got a login prompt, it used 50 very, very common combinations of username and password, right? It might be user, user, or it might be admin, password, or simple things that you would never, ever, ever do, I hope. And if it was able to log in with privilege, then it dropped malware onto the device which then allowed them to essentially control the device and flood the backbone of the internet, things like DIN, with just random baloney traffic which brought them to their knees. And so most of the time when you have access control, you have usernames and passwords that control it. And so what you don't want is you don't want those roles to be activated until there is some kind of secure username and password around it. And that only happens if you design that in. Otherwise, you're back to doing user, user, and you are susceptible to external threat, no matter how bulletproof the rest of the device is. And it's a significant security hole in lots of devices. You know, I talk to a lot of people who are entrepreneurial, and they are trying to move the state of the art, move the bar forward in terms of medical therapies and those kinds of things. And so they're really smart and they do wonderful things and they know nothing about how to design and develop a device. And this is one of the things, if I ask them, have you considered this, that they almost never do, right? I mean, the big companies, the Apples of the world, the Johnsons and Johnsons, you know, those kinds of things, sure, that's fine. But most medical device advances are done by individuals or small companies who are trying to make a splash or a name for themselves with something truly innovative. And so this combination of access control and password can be a big trip up for them while they're trying to get through approval. Sure. That makes sense, Rob. So in medical security in particular, data privacy and data security and encryption go hand in hand, right? They sure do. Okay, so you've gotten over those kind of upfront kinds of things. Then you kind of think about, well, what kind of information am I actually holding? Am I holding personal information that can be mapped to the user? If so, then HIPAA and other regulations apply and are going to require me to really safeguard that data. And how do I safeguard that data? Well, I have to worry about encryption because encryption is how we hide information kind of in plain sight, as a matter of fact, from people who might want to be able to access it. 
so basically, I have to use encryption kind of at all steps of the way, right? If it's just sitting in storage in a database somewhere, is it encrypted? Can it not be easily accessed? And if it is accessed, can it not be easily read? When I am using it on the device, is it still secure? Is it still encrypted? And then most importantly, really, is when I am transmitting it from the device to the doctor or within the hospital network or wherever it is I am transmitting it, is that data still secure? And that's all using encryption. And there's lots of techniques for encryption. It's a little much to go into here, but it's something you need to think of up front. How are you going to protect and encrypt the data? And then the other part is, is the device protected from tampering? Now, for those of you who might come from other aspects of the security world, we're not talking necessarily about physical tamper protection, even though we might be. You know, things like FIPS 140 security and those kinds of things. We're not really talking at that level. But we're talking about a level where I have a device, I boot that device, I turn it on. Can the device guarantee that what it's running is what it's supposed to be running? And can I not put new things onto that device without the device being able to verify that they're supposed to be there. Modern hardware gives us a lot of legs up, right? We used to do all of this in software, and it was, you know, it was software. It could be buggy, it could have its own problems, those kinds of things. Modern hardware gives us a lot of things that help with security and secure boot and secure update and those kinds of things. But they're only there if you use them. They're there. But it's kind of like the lock on your door. If you don't use it, then your door is unlocked. So, Rob, an important aspect of any medical design is life cycle. Some of these designs need to be in the field for a really long time. How do we protect these designs with the future in mind? That's a good question. I mean, when you're looking at the lifetime of your device, you need to think about things up front. If we go back to the example of the Mirai botnet, the kinds of devices that were affected for the most part by the Mirai botnet were the kinds of devices that actually had no facilities in them to improve their security, right? You bought it, it had the software on it, it had on it. There was no real way to update it. There's no real way to impact it. It was just there. And that's why there are still a lot of devices out there that are susceptible to it. So the time to talk about how you're going to protect your device from the future is while you're developing it today. And you need to think about things like, how am I going to securely update the device? How often am I going to do it? These are medical devices. In some cases, they're multi-million dollar medical devices. So basically, I can't just update it willy-nilly every time I think it's a good thing to do. I need to be able to schedule updates so that we can schedule the downtimes of the devices. The last thing we want to do is have a patient monitoring device get updated in the middle of an operation. That might not be a good thing. So basically, your whole goal is to minimize your downtime while you're taking care of updating the device and then obviously protecting user data. And why do I focus so much on updating the device? Well, as you mentioned, the device is going to be around a long time. It's going to be measured in years or maybe in decades. You need to get your head around the thought that your device, when you release it, no matter how well you design it and how well you develop it and how well you test it and how much effort you went through to achieve regulatory approval, after all of that, your device will have bugs. It'll have defects. And you'll have defects that will need to be taken care of during the lifetime of the device. And even if you're perfect, even if your development team is perfect, even if your testing is perfect, if you're using open source software or if you're using even software you've developed yourselves, the bad guys are constantly trying to poke and prod and get into that device. And at some point, they're going to be successful. And therefore, your device, no matter how much you try, will have vulnerabilities. And you won't know what they are until years after they're released. So this is why we talk so much about being able to update the device, because at the end of the day, there are more than 300 vulnerabilities that are identified every week that are reported to the National Vulnerability Database and to Mitra and are then known to the world, both the good guys and the bad guys. Now, most of these CVEs are not applicable to your device. You may not be using the package in which they were found. 
And a lot of CVEs are reported against old versions of modules. For the most part, you're not going to care what happened in a 10-year-old version of OpenSSH, assuming that you're using OpenSSH. But you don't know that until you look at it. And so 300 times a week, there is a potential vulnerability identified and publicized that you should be looking at and determining whether or not there is an impact. That's a lot of work. Um, and, you know, and then once you found those CVEs, then you have to find, well, where are they fixed? If you're using Linux, the Linux kernel itself is really good about this. And certain open source modules like OpenSSL are really good at this. Other open source modules, you know, it's a community. Different communities operate differently, and there are of different sizes. Right? Some of these communities are a couple of guys who took an interest in something and wrote a module for it. So you need to basically understand how you're going to update or patch your open source when these CVEs are identified. And if you have proprietary software that's doing something similar, you at least need to consider whether or not those same vulnerabilities might apply to you. So this monitoring aspect for CVEs is a big chunk of this protection from the future that we're talking about. And the regulatory agencies now are demanding more and more that the device manufacturer have a plan for addressing CVEs in their devices during the lifetime of the device. And so you just need to figure out how you're going to do that. And then once you kind of understand how you're going to manage these vulnerabilities, then you go back to what we were talking about before. Once you've identified CVEs that might impact you and you've figured out how to fix them, then you need to be able to update your device to take advantage of them. And so once you've done all of that, then you take all of this that you built into your product from the beginning and apply that knowledge and capability to updating the device, and now your device is again secure. Okay, so Rob, what other things should we think about when it comes to medical security? When we talk about securing a device... We're going to look at a number of techniques that are used in other industries that provide kind of some guidance to us on how we might also be able to secure a medical device. Like I said before, when we talk about the techniques of security, there's nothing really special about a medical device. It's the kind of data, it's the life cycle requirements, it's all of those things, the regulatory requirements, that require us to kind of think about it in a medical-specific way. But when we talk about things like development techniques, really we're just talking about general purpose security. And when we're talking about general purpose security, you know, we talk about features, but we also talk about how we're developing something. We have to assume that at some point a bad actor will be able to access the device, and we want to make it difficult to exploit when they do. But we can take advantage of the fact that most exploits really are, at their root cause, a small number of engineering defects. If you go to the National Vulnerability Database, there are over 10,000 vulnerabilities listed. And every major one of those vulnerabilities has with it basically a root cause. And there's really only about 30 of these. Things that were done in the software that were then able to be exploited, and then the bad guys or the researchers were be able to inject code that could run or drop in malware or whatever to make the device do something that it wasn't intended. And, you know, we're talking about things that are really kind of simple when you think about it. A null pointer dereference, that could cause a problem that can be exploited. Using memory that's already been freed, overflowing a fixed length buffer, which the C language is very, very good at. These kinds of recurring software problems are what causes most of these vulnerabilities. And so the whole concept of using these kinds of preventative techniques is to identify during development that these things have crept into your implementation and then taking care of them. I see. So, Rob, when you say preventative techniques during the development of the device software, what exactly do you mean? When you're developing embedded software, there's actually a lot of information that you can get without causing too much heartache that will tell you if something might not be what it should be. 
You know, the very first step, and I'm always amazed at how many people don't really take advantage of this, is looking at what the compiler tells you. Many organizations turn off warnings or put them on the lowest possible warning level because they don't like seeing a lot of warnings when they compile their software. That's a really bad idea because the compiler is giving you warnings because you're doing things that might have undefined behavior. And undefined behavior really gets back to what we were just talking about. Those are the root causes of things that could lead to exploits. So turn up the warning level. You'll find a bunch of things you don't like, but you can take care of them during development while it's not very hard to do. And then the next step beyond that is to do some kind of static analysis tool. There are a lot of static analysis tools out there in the world. Things from the open source like CPP Check or Clang are really very solid and will identify for you potential areas in your code when you're doing something that can be exploited. You know, and there are also proprietary tools, and they're great too. But really, at the end of the day, those kinds of automated tools, they'll find the mechanical errors in your software for you. And they will allow you during inspections or during reviews to focus on what your device is supposed to do. Is it doing what it's supposed to do? And is it doing it safely? And let the tools find the mechanical problems. You'll be way far ahead. And then the other thing I recommend to people is to adopt a coding standard. And when I say a coding standard, a lot of people have been through the coding standard wars. And it's all about formatting. Do we do seven spaces or do we do tabs? I mean, this goes back to Fortran. And that's not what I'm talking about. When I say coding standard, I'm talking about something that is telling developers, hey, we know a lot of what causes bad behavior. And we know that there are things that are perfectly legal in the language, especially if you're using C, that really are a root cause of huge numbers of problems. So don't do them. There's no reason to do an assignment statement within an if statement. The compiler will optimize it, and it makes the code harder to read and harder to understand if you've done something wrong. And so the MISRA coding standard, which came to us from the automotive world, MISRA is actually an automotive acronym, but it actually codifies insecure code constructs that you should stay away from. If you're looking specifically at security, Carnegie Mellon, through the Software Engineering Institute, has come up with Cert C, and then they have other variants for C++ and for Python and whatever, that is focused completely on security. And it shouldn't really be a surprise. There's a lot of overlap with Misra, which is completely focused on safety, because at the end of the day, a flaw that causes a safety problem is probably causing a security problem. And the reverse is always true. If you have a security problem, then your device isn't going to be safe because it can be exploited. So those things go a long way to making sure that the code you come up with actually is going to be harder to exploit by the outside world. That makes sense. So, Rob, is there anything else we can do to keep the bad guys at bay? Well, you know, those bad guys. So basically, when they try to access your device, right, what they're doing, it's not rocket science. I mean, they have experience. They've got techniques that they use to try to get into your device. And then they've got human ingenuity kind of backed by a profit motive to try to get in there. But those techniques are pretty well known. One technique that I am very strong advocate of is called fuzz testing, where you basically set up a system outside of your device to just blast internet data at it. Some of it may be well-formed, some of it may be garbage, some of it may be partially well-formed, where like the first part of the packet looks like a perfectly valid protocol packet, and then the second half of the packet is garbage. Anything like that, just kind of blast data at it and see what happens to the device. Sometimes the device, you know, sometimes nothing will happen to the device, but every once in a while, you'll either be able to crash the device or worse, you might be able to get it into a different state and then you can refine the kinds of data that you're blasting at it to be able to figure out how to inject malware into the device. And so fuzz testing is something that you can do proactively to minimize the likelihood that the bad guys will find anything when they try this. And then the other thing that I recommend, even though it's time consuming and it can be expensive, is to take advantage of the fact that they're not doing anything that other people don't know. You know, I spent a lot of time earlier talking about CVEs, and it used to be that vulnerabilities were found mostly by the bad guys. 
and they were exploited. And then eventually companies would figure out what had happened and then they would prevent that in the future. You know, now that still happens, but for the most part, exploits are found by researchers, graduate students, other people who understand the techniques who sit there and try to figure out how they can access the device because they want to make sure the device is more secure. You can do that testing. You can hire people who have those skills, or you can bring in consultants that have those skills to do what we call penetration testing, which is essentially, here's the device, try to break into it. Tell me how you can do that. And then they tell you, and you can take care of those things before you go to market. And that is probably the number one thing that you can do during testing that will secure your device out in the field. Like I said, it's very expensive. If you're doing a $10 device, it may well not be worth it. But if you're doing $2 million MRI machine, well, maybe it is. That makes sense. Now, Rob, how can Mentor help me specifically with securing my next medical design? So we talked a lot a little while ago about the CVE process and how the huge number of CVEs that come in need to be looked at and investigated and mapped to the open source that you're using, all of those kinds of things. Mentor provides Linux and other kinds of uh, open source modules to a large number of medical device manufacturers. A lot of medical device manufacturers today are using Linux in their design. And why are they using Linux? Well, it's very flexible. Engineers understand how to implement and develop on top of it. It's very secure by itself. And the open source worldwide community kind of ensures that we're constantly moving forward in terms of understanding, you know, how the system works and how it's going to be protected and all of those things. And also it has the greatest connectivity capabilities of any operating system in the world. When I compare Linux to a proprietary RTOS, the RTOS has its own advantages, but if I'm concerned about connectivity, if I'm concerned about what kinds of devices I can support, all of those things, I'm much more likely to find it in Linux than anywhere else. And so what's happening more and more is that medical device manufacturers are deciding that using Linux and other open source in their device solves a lot of problems that they've had. But a problem that bringing that open source in does is it opens you up to all of these CVEs that come in. So you could just go to you know, kernel.org and download Linux, or you can go to Yocto and download a Linux distribution with all of the packages, or you can use Debian, or you can use any number of things. Your board vendor probably gave you a Linux when you bought your board. But the problem is, how do I get from there to managing this 300 CVEs that come in every week? That's where bringing in a commercial Linux distribution like Mentor Embedded Linux really kind of comes in, because Mentor specializes in Linux and open source capabilities. And so we can monitor the community for you and make available to you fixes and patches as necessary so you can update your device and that you can focus only on the capabilities that your device represents. And because Mentor is now part of Siemens, and Siemens has a worldwide infrastructure that is specifically designed to support the ongoing security of Siemens devices. And we leverage those capabilities into our monitoring for vulnerabilities that we can then make available to our customers. Basically, we know what open source you have, we know where the issues are coming in from the rest of the world, and we can bring all of that together in a fully validated, complete solution to you on a schedule that you can define. And that makes the whole problem of dealing with the ongoing number of vulnerabilities that you're going to be asked about during your certification and your regulatory approval processes it makes that whole process much easier for you to manage. That makes sense. Now, Rob, this is just one part of the embedded ecosystem at Mentor, right? That is correct. And, and Mentor provides kind of the broadest collection of embedded solutions of any developer in the world. There are people who do RTOSs or RTOSs and Linux or other kinds of things, but there's only one vendor that brings together a strong focus on Linux, a strong focus on RTOS through our Nucleus operating system, 
hypervisors. We have a complete multi-core solution that's based on OpenAMP, which we designed and developed in conjunction with a microprocessor vendor. We have tools. We have end-to-end -end connectivity. We have certified solutions, machine learning, custom tool chains. We are the number one maintainer of embedded GCC in the world. Many microprocessor vendors come to us and work with us to make sure that their processors are well supported by GCC. We have this end-to-end -end capability and embedded, and we're focusing all of the time on performance, on safety, on security, and on capabilities for our users. Excellent. Well, this has been super cool, Rob. Thank you so much for joining me today. Well, thank you, Amelia. It's been great. And if anyone has any questions, feel free to come to Mentor.com and ask away. And before we go, you didn't forget to click that link, did you? There you can find even more information about medical device security solutions from Mentor. For Chalk Talks, I'm Amelia Dalton from eejournal.com. For more Chalk Talks, head on over to the Chalk Talks section of EE Journal. You can't miss it. It's right across the top. Or head on over to YouTube, youtube.com slash eejournal. 